He was an uncompromising champion who lifted himself up from humble beginnings to become for a time one of the most celebrated men in America. As a supremely gifted athlete, Jesse Owens captivated citizens of all races and in the process challenged the prejudiced notions of what an African American man could accomplish. Through it all, in a country deeply divided by race, where African Americans had few rights and fewer opportunities, he refused to accept second-class citizenship. On our latest episode of Hindsight History, we discover the man who single-handedly crushed Hitler's myth of Aryan supremacy. As the son of a sharecropper and the grandson of a slave, life in the Deep South was difficult for the young Jesse Owens. Growing up in the community of Oakville, Alabama, Jesse split time between going to school and laboring in the cotton fields each day. When he managed to have a window of time, he ran everywhere he could, often sprinting to school, to home, and when his mother Mary Emma wasn't watching, after church. At the age of nine, Owens and his family decided to move to Cleveland, Ohio at a time when 1.5 million African Americans left the segregated South for better opportunities and social mobility. This move proved to be the making of the eventual Olympian. While attending Fairmont Junior High, the young Owens met track coach Charles Riley, who quickly realized the potential the young man possessed. Over the years, Riley taught Owens a unique style of running. He would take Jesse to watch horse races in Ohio for the young runner to observe the way the animals moved. Owens would later recall his coach instructing him to never look to his left or right as it's only going to slow you down. By emphasizing the importance of form and fluidity, Riley taught Owens to run as if the track were on fire and as if his life depended on it. These principles would build a foundation for the young gifted athlete. Off the track, Riley took it upon himself to mentor Jesse Owens. He regularly invited Owens to his home to instill in him the social graces to interact effectively with members of white society. Historians often state that Riley treated Owens as if he was his own son. Through this relationship, Owens became tremendously well-mannered as well as an effective communicator. On one occasion, Riley introduced Owens to Olympic gold medalist Charles Paddock. The coach told Jesse that he could be like this Olympian, but it would require total dedication and an immense amount of effort. Years later, Paddock would watch this young man he met shatter his own records. At East Technical High School, Owens quickly made a name for himself as a nationally recognized sprinter, setting AAU records in the 100 and 200 yard dash as well as the long jump. In the 100, Owens equaled the world record of 9.4 seconds. He didn't run, his high school coaches later claimed. He floated, seeming to caress the ground. Jesse's success on the track made him a sought-after recruit among the few four-year colleges that would even consider a black athlete. Jesse chose nearby Ohio State, which allowed Owens to work part-time to pay his tuition. Arriving on campus, Owens discovered that while the athletic program recruited some black athletes, the student population of African Americans was minuscule. The previous year, an African American student, Doris Weaver, took Ohio State University to the Ohio Supreme Court 
for not permitting her to live with other economic students in a racially segregated house. The court ultimately ruled in favor of Ohio State, upholding its separate but equal code. The university had only one men's dorm on campus, and Owens was barred from it because of his race. No restaurant along High Street would serve him, nor was he allowed to go to most movie theaters. Despite these slights, when it came to the track, Owens was immediately at home. He selectively chose to only be influenced by the opinions of those who mattered most to him. One of those people was Ohio State coach Larry Snyder. The coach had high expectations of his athletes and established a rigorous training schedule. He also incorporated a creative approach to these trainings, having his athletes run while listening to music he played on the school's phonograph record player believing that running to music helped develop an even stride and pace. Snyder would use his credibility to have the talented Owens elected captain of the track team, becoming the first African American to receive the honor. On May 25, 1935, a little more than a year before the Olympics were to be held in Berlin, the Buckeye Bullet would achieve international fame in what would become known as the greatest day in track history. The setting was the Big Ten Track and Field Championships in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Despite being instructed by Coach Snyder to sit out of the meet due to suffering a painful back injury after falling down a flight of stairs while horse playing with his teammates, Owens declined. He later said, when you come from where I did, you really don't believe in tomorrow. Within 45 minutes, Owens would set three world records and tie for a fourth. In the 220-yard low hurdles, Owens would clock 22.6 seconds, becoming the first person to break 23 seconds. And his world record in the long jump would last for 25 years. The 21-year-old sophomore quickly became known as the fastest man in the world. Across the channel, the Olympic Games were beginning to take shape in Germany. The leader of the host country, Adolf Hitler, was destined to prove that the forces of history were on his side. It was ironic that the Olympic Games, the symbol of international peace and cooperation, was being held on the home grounds of Adolf Hitler, the international symbol of the rising tide of racism. The Fuhrer was initially against hosting the Olympic Games in Berlin. It would take the German filmmaker Lenny Riefenstahl to persuade him to leverage the sporting event as a world stage to showcase the Aryan master race. Within the United States, many private citizens and politicians encouraged Owens and other athletes to boycott the games due to more reports surfacing of the Germans' treatment towards Jewish people and other minorities. The Olympic Committee decided to act and send its president, Avery Brundage, to Berlin to meet with the Nazi officials. Prime Minister Josef Goebbels entertained Brundage and assured him of the utmost equality by the German nation. The Nazis even went out of their way to make sure the Germans had a token Jewish athlete on their team. Gretel Bergman had fled Germany years earlier to Great Britain, where she would break the women's record in the high jump. Now with the pressure of silencing anti-Semitism throughout their country, the Germans ordered Bergman to return to Germany to represent them in the Summer Games. Ultimately satisfied with these efforts, Brundage returned to the United States giving high praise to the German government and declaring that the Olympic Games belonged to the athletes. Ultimately, Owens decided not to pass up the once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. As the Americans traveled across the Atlantic, 
the Germans took back their promise. They sent Bergman a letter informing her that she would not represent Germany in the Olympics. The German track and field team claimed that Gretel Bergman was injured and she was not only cut from the team, but her high jump records would be erased from the record books. When the Americans arrived in Berlin, they were astonished at the hospitality they received. Owens claimed that the Olympic Village where the team resided was one of the seven wonders of the world. In the backdrop of what appeared to be a country club, African American athletes were treated as equals and even had their own chefs to prepare their meals within the dining hall. The Nazis had choreographed every detail to impress the eyes that were watching them. The German press received direct orders to only publish positive stories about black athletes. All anti-Semitic signs and graffiti were to be removed. On the opening day of the games, 5,000 athletes from 53 countries watched as the airship Hindenburg flew overhead. More than one million Germans lined the swastika-covered streets and cheered hysterically to catch a glimpse of their Fuhrer as he was driven to the stadium. As Hitler entered, 60 trumpeters sounded a fanfare, and on signal, 3,000 white pigeons were released throughout the stadium. With the birds flying overhead, a German runner sprinted across the arena and lit the Olympic flame, signaling the opening of the 11th Olympiad. From his spacious balcony, Hitler spoke to the 110,000 spectators. Owens' first test would be the 100-yard dash. Hitler was eager to see the German Erich Borkmeier defend the fatherland. Owens liegt schon vorn, stand bald hinter ihm, Rosenberg kämpft sich heran. Owens clocked 10.3 seconds and was challenged only by fellow American teammate Ralph Metcalf. Borkmeyer would miss the medal stand entirely. It was obvious that something amazing was happening, not just on the track, but off of it. It didn't take long for the Nazi hierarchy to realize that the great propaganda move was backfiring. Owens was just warming up. He would be the first person in history to break 21 seconds in the 200 meter dash, clocking in at 20.7 seconds. Owens next moved on to the long jump event. He would almost not qualify after fouling his first two attempts. His competitor, the German hero Lutz Long, pulled him aside and gave him advice which he never forgot. He recommended Owens to mark his takeoff point. This advice helped Owens not only qualify for the event, but eventually win gold.
jumping an Olympic record of 26.67 feet. At the end of the competition, Long was the first to congratulate Owens, throwing his arm around him and walking around the track together directly in front of Hitler's box as the crowd cheered their approval. Although it is debated today by historians on whether Hitler truly snubbed Jesse Owens by never shaking the athlete's hand, what we do know is that as the Fuhrer left that evening via the tunnel under the Tribune, Nazi officials advised the Fuhrer that Lutz Long was on hand alone. Hitler would congratulate and shake hands with the silver medal winner. Throughout the course of the 1936 games, the Fuhrer never once shook hands with any of the 18 African American athletes. Nazi minister Albert Speer would later write that Hitler was highly annoyed by the series of triumphs by the marvelous colored American runner Jesse Owens. People whose antecedents came from the jungle were primitive, Hitler said with a shrug. Their physiques were stronger than those of civilized whites and hence should be excluded from future games. Owens remained unfazed by the media attention this received, as the only approval that mattered to him was that of his competitor Lutz Long, who would exchange correspondence in the years following the games until the German athlete's death in 1943 while fighting in the Second World War. On his final challenge, Owens was chosen to run in the 400 meter relay. When selected by his American coaches, Owens initially refused as racial politics became present even on his own team. On the morning of the event, Jesse's coaches had benched two Jewish American sprinters, Marty Glickman and Sam Stoller, who had traveled to Berlin to specifically run in the 400 meter event. The two men were heartbroken. It became apparent that anti-Semitism was at play in an effort to avoid offending Hitler, who had been directing anti-Jewish policies since 1933. This event would continue to haunt the American Olympic establishment for decades. Owens conceded and competed with every fiber of his being. He helped the relay team clench another gold medal in the event. The press stated that he completed the greatest feat of modern athletic history. As he stepped onto the honor platform for the victory ceremony, one of the greatest ovations of the Olympics roared across the stadium. For one brief shining moment, Jesse Owens was the most famous athlete in the world. Owens returned from Berlin and was welcomed with a grand parade in Cleveland. He was a hero, but he was a black hero, and the market for black heroes was limited. Upon landing in New York, Owens and his wife soon realized that life would be different for him back home than it had been in Berlin, as the couple was unable to find a hotel that would permit them to spend the night. Although many today reference Adolf Hitler snubbing him at the games, not much light is shed on the fact that his own president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, also refused to meet with him upon returning to the United States. Roosevelt, who was dependent upon the southern white demographic for his re-election, who would appoint a former member of the Ku Klux Klan, Hugo Black, to the Supreme Court, and neither enacted nor supported legislation to outlaw lynching, would never even go so far as to send a telegram congratulating the 22-year-old gold medalist. There would also be no invitation to the White House to meet with the President. That honor was reserved for white Olympians. 
at the non-presidential reception at the Waldorf Astoria, Owens and his mother had to use the freight elevator to enter the building. Returning from the Olympics, Owens made the startling announcement that he would close his amateur career and turn professional, despite the fact that he had one more year of eligibility. He dropped out of Ohio State, lured by the promise of riches that would never come. A few days after the announcement, Owens signed a contract with the same theatrical agency that represented Bill Bojangles Robinson. He soon learned that there were not many meaningful jobs for a black athlete in 1930s America. Jesse's teammate in the Olympics, Mac Robinson, older brother of future baseball Hall of Famer Jackie Robinson, who outran Hitler's Aryan sprinters and finished only behind Owens in the 200 meter dash, would return home to Pasadena, California, where the only work Mac Robinson could find was as a street sweeper. If it had been a different time, Mac Robinson may have become a celebrity. Robinson would wear his Olympic jacket when he got cold, working in the streets. The first opportunity Owens could get was to appear during the Cuban National Sports Festival in December of 1936, where he would run the 100 meter dash against a racehorse. His friends and teammates could only look on sadly to the fate that had befallen the track legend. Owens later said, People say that it was degrading for an Olympic champion to run against a horse, but what was I supposed to do? I had four gold medals, but you can't eat four gold medals. When the theater performances with Bill Bojangles Robinson didn't provide sufficient means for Owens, he pursued working as a gas station attendant and running a dry cleaning business. Neither would benefit him as he would eventually file for bankruptcy. Jesse Owens wouldn't receive the official thanks of his country until President Gerald Ford awarded him the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Mark Twain said, History doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. As an American who rose from poverty to a position of leadership, Jesse Owens continues to inspire others to make the most of what America has to offer. During a time of injustice, he nonetheless turned the other cheek to the threats and abuse he would endure, and made it possible for others to follow in his footsteps. In 1964, while appearing before a group of Ohio school children, Owens made the analogy that, there's a piano before us today, a piano with 88 keys, black and white. In order to make harmony with this instrument, we need all the keys, both black and white. Thus it is in life. <laughs> 